Good Friday morning, friends. Uh, it is Friday at 9 a.m., which means it's time for another installment of the Backyard Naturalist, brought to you by the Urban Ecology Center here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My name is Tim. I will be your host on this beautiful spring morning, cold rains on the way, uh, which is perfect because even though outside it might be getting cold and rainy, which is also a great time to be outside. Uh, but Na Backyard Naturalist comes to you rain or shine or anything in between as long as we have power. We'll have Backyard Naturalist coming to your devices on Friday mornings at 9 a.m. And on this program, we talk about all of the critters that are or could be in your backyards, your front yards, your patios, or even in your house, whether we want them there or not. From the cute and cuddly possums to the cute and cuddly fleas, uh, which I will say objectively, I actually hope are not in your house right now um, as as, uh, as we look at this opening slide that's not a movie or a TV show, but it's an album cover. I think that might be a first. So sit back and relax. The Eagles, uh, obviously. Um, but uh, grab yourself a cup of coffee or tea or whatever beverage you prefer as we listen to the wonderful and gross stories and amazing stories that are told by the flea in episode 27 of season five of The Backyard Naturalist. Hell fleezes over, but first, we are really glad you're here with us. I love the folks that are able to join us live, and I love the conversation and poems uh, that that come from you together before and after the episode, um, and uh, I love the folks that join us after this. If you're watching us uh, on the YouTube channel, I'm glad to be spending this time with you as well. Uh, as always, a huge thank you to those among you that are subscribers to The Backyard Naturalist. Your support is invaluable, and if you enjoy this program and you're not a subscriber and you're able and willing, I encourage you to look into the benefits of supporting the series as a subscriber, um, from not having to register each week to the monthly field trips, which includes our trip next week, Saturday, up to Blue Lotus with Executive Director Mike Larson. And uh, hot off the press, he, he, he is going to be joining us in the van um, up to the Blue Lotus Center. So extra time with uh, with the amazing Mike Larson, uh, who spoke to this community last fall uh, as a host. Um, Blue Lotus is doing fantastic work up in Ozaki County, connecting folks with profound life challenges to outdoor recreational and therapeutic activities. It truly is a hidden gem, and it's pretty far off the beaten path. So if you don't want to have to beat the path, you can come up with the UEC in our van as long as there's room. So register what early. That be? Uh, that's next Saturday. Time. Next week, Saturday. Uh, one o'clock is when we're meeting up there. So I imagine the van will meet, leave probably around noon. Good. So, then I can, I can make it after the tree identification class. Fantastic. You'll be you'll already be there. Um. So this, tro this trip is open to everyone. It's free to Backyard Naturalist subscribers. Uh, and then in April, we're staying closer to home, visiting another hidden gem that is not so far off the beaten path. In fact, this is right in the right in UWM. Um, and so you won't believe how close you are to the beaten path as we visit Downer Woods with Professor Allison Donnelly, who also recently hosted a backyard naturalist um, and her phenological studies in the area. So we'd love for you to join us on these trips. And of course, uh, again, every Friday on Backyard Naturalist. Um, okay. Also, just a reminder that uh, UEC will be taking a trip down to Costa Rica at the end of the summer on our first international accessible trip as we partner with two fantastic local organizations in Costa Rica, uh, Costa Rica Rainforest Experience and Il Viaggio Travel, uh, who have partnered up with the UEC for a trip uh, for those that might have mobility or other challenges. Um, as uh, so look for that trip on our website very soon. That's a place that we go every year. Um, and then just a couple more quick plugs before we jump into the topic of fleas. Uh, this Sunday, March 10th, uh, the Urban Ecology Center Riverside Park is hosting its annual Green Wedding Expo. Uh, a typical wedding can have a huge carbon footprint. So join us to learn helpful, easy, and accessible ways to reduce that footprint and have a sustainable, eco-friendly wedding. So if you're thinking of tying the knot or renewing your wedding vows, or if you know someone who might be or is planning to, or if you just want to learn more about green weddings, uh, come to 
or spread the word about Eco I Do. And uh, you can learn more about this event on the Urban Ecology Center web page as you're giving us um, feedback. And then finally, um, the Backyard Naturalist, which started out as a weekly virtual program, then spread to monthly field trips, is now excited to bring you the Backyard Naturalist, the yet to be named course. Um, it's gonna be a seven week long summer course uh, out in the field. We will explore a bunch of different terrestrial and aquatic habitats. We'll look for patterns. We'll learn about natural history. We'll discuss the evolutionary questions, the ecological questions. So stay tuned for more information. And of course, there will be a discount for subscribers for that. And I do feel it's important that um, to to post among my sources of information this week and most weeks, one of, one of the more prominent is the How Stuff Works Media Group, which includes the website, the podcast, the great articles and videos. Uh, it's a pretty standard reference for me for these episodes. And uh, it's it's just a really, really fun resource. So, okay, we're going with fleas with over 200 episodes behind us. Um, we, we certainly have the capacity to start grouping these episodes into categories. And so today's episode could be grouped into several fun categories like animals most of us don't want in our houses. Um, so these are these are critters we'd covered in the in the past. Um, it could be animals that give us the creeps regardless of whether or not they're good to have in our house. A lot of them are. Um, but again, these are all past backyard naturalists. And then you have, uh, it's hard to believe there is an entire group of animals that suck human blood. Um, and we've covered all these. So, and, and we still have more to do. We still haven't done uh, chiggers. We still haven't do, done uh, head lice. Um, so it's, it's pretty crazy to think how many animals are blood specialists and even human blood specialists or, or among the mammals. Um, so we, I guess we do have quite a bit of blood in our body. So that makes a good food source for a lot of animals. Um, you could also say that this slide is is the group of, of animals that can spread deadly diseases. I guess any animal that's gonna um, get into your bloodstream is also could be a potential vector of diseases. Um, but these are also animals that have some pretty amazing adaptations that have made them really successful, uh, particularly in co-evolving with humans. So there is, there is wonder in that. Um, to kind of put the flea in our family photo album of the taxonomic tree of life. Uh, these are, I just did this for, for fun. These are all backyard naturalist topics that we've covered in the, in the past few years. Um, and it's not even complete, but these are all the insects um, or mo so, I should say a, a portion of the insects. We've covered more than this, but we've at least covered all of these um, between all of the great hosts we've had in the past. Um, so all of these have been featured on Backyard Naturalist if you're looking for a quick summary of, of what you can look for. Um, and, and seeing this offers a bit of nostalgia for me, like, you know, at, through time, these are these are the critters whose stories we told on this program. It's kind of looking at like a, a photo album of, of your family growing up. Um, but yes, like all of these stars, fleas are indeed insects. And that's the group that we start with. In fact, they make up a very large and diverse order of insects, the Siphonoptera. Um, and this, a lot of the pictures we have of fleas are going to be like electron micrographs because fleas are tiny. Uh, that's one of the major characteristics of fleas. They're, they're as adults, um, you can expect them, most species, to reach the size of about an eighth of an inch long, so barely visible. Um, and this also demonstrates that they're all leg. They're adapted extremely well for jumping. There are over 2,500 species. They're flightless. Um, and they're all parasites. They're all either mammal or bird parasites. As adults, they're blood-eating specialists. Most of them have a very flattened body plan, which allows them to move deftly through fur or feathers of their hosts, um, mammals or birds. And then they also have these nice sticky claws that uh, allow them to hang on their hosts uh, when they need to. And they have piercing and sucking mouth parts, which are important, uh, at least for the adults, to get the blood that they so need for their blood meal. So fleas are uh, ectoparasites. Ecto meaning they live on the outside of your body uh, from once they find the blood meals. Um, of the more than 2,500 species, the most common in the U.S. is 
at least, is the cat flea, uh, which we see here. But don't let the name fool you. Cat fleas will also love to feed on your dogs, and they love to feed on, feed on humans. Um, and if there is a cat flea, you can be pretty sure that there is also a dog flea, which also don't let the name fool you because dog fleas will also feed on your cats and they will feed on humans and they'll feed on raccoons and livestock, pigs, squirrels, other wild animals. So um, fleas are wingless, but one prominent feature you see on this micrograph is the, the kind of chain armor they have. Uh, they, they're covered in a series of hard plates called sclerites, and sclerites pretty much offer protection to the flea. Uh, so they can't defend themselves by flying away. They can jump away, um, but if you jump, you're going to land, and that can be pretty hard. And so the sclerites protect them from the landing. They protect themselves from uh, the claws and fingernails of things that are trying to get them off of them. Um, and anything else that, that the hosts use to try to kill them. I do remember, uh, our dog Pepper once had a flea infestation and I remember it was really hard to, to squash those little critters with my fingernails because A, they were so small, but B, they were just hard to kill. Um, so it's kind of like they're wearing a suit of armor and, um, uh, it's like that, that, like I said, like chain mail, um, protecting the fleas and they're exceptionally good at jumping probably the only insect group that rivals and beats the fleas at jumping are the frog hoppers, which we covered a few years back uh, on Backyard Naturalist because the larval form of frog hoppers are in pretty probably all of our backyards and, and you might know them as spittle bugs. And then when they become adults, they become frog hoppers, which are probably the best jumpers of the insect world. But fleas are, are uh, no slouches for it you know, by any stretch of the imagination, they can jump eight inches straight up vertically and they can jump 13 inches horizontally. It doesn't sound like much, but remember they're an eighth of an inch long. So if you do that proportionally, if you, if you take a flea and put it in human terms, um, that would be the same as a human jumping 360 feet high and 660 feet out horizontally. Uh, so if that still doesn't seem impressive, then, you know, just imagine yourself going downtown Milwaukee and jumping to the top of city hall in one jump, one leap. That's proportionally what fleas can do to their, from their body size or go down to Lambeau field and, um, you know, see what you can do as a long jump. And if you're a flea, uh, you could jump essentially from the back row of one end zone over the football field to the back row of the other end zone, um, the, you know, about roughly 660 feet. So fleas are amazing jumpers. Um, and the, the current human record for the long jump is just a few inches past 12 feet. Again, this isn't the running long jump. This is the standing long jump because that's what fleas do. Uh, so that's just um, 648 feet short of what a human could do if they were a flea. So amazing jumpers. Um, I'm not going to go over the entire life cycle of a flea in a lot of detail because a lot of the insects have that same pattern. Um, and, and you know, to do that every time we do it, an insect would, would take a lot. So if, particularly if you go to some of the early insect episodes, um, we go in a little bit more into the life cycle of insects, which is really cool. Um, uh, but it is, it is somewhat important to the story. So we'll start, let's say, with this adult female flea. Um, and we can see, again, all legs. Uh, we can see some of the, a little bit of the protective armor. It does not, doesn't show up too well here. Um, and you can see that she's covered in tiny hairs all over her body. And um, a lot of insects have those, those tiny hairs, and they use them for a lot of reasons. But on, on fleas in particular... Where, where sometimes those those hairs would just kind of go out in all direction. Um, fleas, usually those hairs are all going in the same direction. Um, like, you know, like they're, they're combing them back because uh, that allows her to essentially really maneuver quickly through the dense hairs of, of whatever uh, host they're on, whether it be a dog or a cat. And, and some of those, you know, undercoat hairs, it can be pretty, pretty like going through a pretty thick forest. Um, so, 
So being able to move quickly through them is important, not getting caught up in those hairs. But uh, it's also important when, you know, your dog does this, that they also need to be able to, to hang on. And so they do have uh, really strong or really sticky claws on their feet. And they can use those hairs to to dig in as well as to, you know, move through depending again on which way they're facing. So um, the the scratching by the dog probably going to be pretty futile because those those fleas are are really good at hanging on. Um, but, you know, feels pretty good in the moment for the dog. And then uh, she's ready to lay her eggs. It's important to note that the eggs are completely smooth because the goal of that egg is not to stay on the host. The goal is to fall off the host. Um, that and that's important. So uh, the the egg is going to develop outside of the host. So wherever that host is, the eggs are going to fall down. If they're outside, the eggs are going to fall into the soil. If it's inside, unfortunately for us, they're going to either fall into um, you know your your pet's bedding or your bedding or the floor. Uh, lots of great places to hide in a floor carpet fibers, a um, lot of imperfections in hardwood floors. Um, so regardless, uh, sh the goal is that hopefully that egg settles into a crevice that's also warm and moist. So fleas tend to be a bigger problem in the south where it is a little more you know humid, warmer. Uh, the ideal conditions for a flea egg to develop are 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 70 to 85 percent humidity. So Outside here in Milwaukee, unless it's summer, that's not the best time. But inside your house, that usually is pretty good. Uh, if temps do fall about four, fall below about 45 degrees, uh, the eggs are, are no longer become or stay viable, uh, and then they won't hatch. So that's one advantage we have up here in the north anyways. We have winters that at least outside your house um, will, will help kill off the fleas. But if the eggs remain in favorable conditions, they will take about 12 days for the embryos to hatch. And then you have these uh, little, oh, so these, these, are, these are the eggs on a soil. And then you have these adorable little larvae that are wandering out and about eating and growing. They start off with chewing mouth parts. And we'll later talk about the sucking mouth parts for your blood. But when they're, when they're larvae, they don't, eat, they don't eat blood. They're just like little vacuum cleaners and they're just going around eating anything they can find, whether it's in the soil, or in it's, it's, if it's in your carpet and, you know, hate to say it, but in your carpet fibers, in your floor, there's plenty uh, for these larvae to eat. They're looking for organic matter. We shed dead skin cells all the time. We shed hair, uh, plenty of things for these critters to eat. Um, e even, you know, excrement from other fleas. It's also pretty gross, but uh, pretty much any organic matter they can scav scavenge. Um, and then as they grow and develop, they undergo three instars or stages of growth until they're ready to pupate, just like a butterfly. And then when they're ready to, to pupate, uh, they return to the depths from which they came and spin a cocoon. And uh, that's where they enter that pupil stage. Uh, so they stay in that stage for a while, and then they will emerge eventually as an adult flea. One of the you know, really good adaptations, but also the problems for us is that uh, it's not a set time once they enter this cocoon. They will only emerge if they sense that there's food nearby. Um, if they don't, they can stay in this cocoon and stay alive uh, for up to a year. So if you if you have them in your, you know, your summer cabin or something, and then you leave and you come back, um, you know, in, as eggs, they, they will certainly have a hard time staying alive. But in these cocoons, if they're kind of in a nice little spot in your, your cabin or whatever, um, they can wait for you to come back uh, for up to a year. Again, it's one of the many reasons why it's so hard to, to completely uh, get rid of a flea infestation. Um, they sense the food either through vibrations um, or they sense it through heat or other chemicals. And, and once they do sense that there is food nearby, uh, then they start the process of hatching, which takes about a week. They don't want to hatch if there's not any any food because they can't live that long as an adult. Um, and only about 5% of the eggs make it to adulthood. Um, and they have to get a blood meal 
in order to reproduce. They can't make eggs without a blood meal. So it is important for the flea to make sure that if they do hatch, um, you know, your dog or your cat or you or something is nearby. And if they sense that, then they emerge from the cocoon. Um, otherwise, they just stay hunkered down <clears throat> in the in the relative safety and camouflaged uh, cocoon. But when they do sense their food, they hatch. Um, and that's a adult hatching. Uh, in once it, once she is successful in finding a blood meal in her lifetime, she can lay uh, up to two thousand eggs. So if you look at the entire diagram, the the life cycle, um, it kind of there's there's a few reasons why uh, they're so so hard to eradicate. Eradicate if you just kill the adults, you probably miss the eggs. The eggs can lie and wait for 12 days. Once you start to get multiple generations, you get multiple hatches, uh, and then you're in trouble because you really have to get all of the eggs and all of the adults. Um, so they're, again, it's just part of the life cycle that makes them really good with humans, but also makes them um, a, a, a real pain. And we, you know, we have, we have a, a couple tools in our arsenal. Um, it, it, we, you know, you can get a flea comb. The, the flea combs are tiny enough uh, with with less than an eighth of an inch space in between the the tongs, and they can pull fleas off a dog. You definitely won't use this as a method of eradication because you won't get them all. Um, but if mom does make it to adulthood and she does mate, she needs that blood meal, and then that's where these really highly specialized mouth parts start to form. So in in the larvae, they just have regular chewing mouth parts, but as adults, they have a very complicated kind of Swiss Army knife of uh, tools to use to to get to your blood or your, or your you know their host blood. So they start by cutting into the skin with what are called maxillary lacinae, uh, which are essentially two sharp saws that they use as saws, uh, kind of back and forth to form an open wound in your skin, and then they insert what's called the epipharynx, which is is like a saliva channel. First, the saliva comes out to prep the wound, and then it pierces the blood vessel and um, you know, anticoagulants, and then they're able to, uh, to, to start drinking your blood. Uh, the saliva kind of fills this, the place, um, and that's where the problems really start for humans and their pets. Because uh, you know, the amount of blood they're taking is not the problem. It's, it's relatively tiny amount, even if you have a lot of fleas on you, uh, and you know, you're a normal size, regular size you know, dog or cat, that's not gonna be a problem at all. It's not, it's not the losing the blood, it's uh, what, what's injected into you uh, when, when, they, when they take the blood. Um, there are a lot of diseases that fleas can transmit, and there are a lot of ways that fleas can transmit diseases. So uh, one of them is injecting the saliva into the wound. That's one of the best places for disease transmission. Um, when the young larval fleas are crawling around like scavengers in your carpet or the soil, that's when they can often ingest other uh, diseases, other um, disease vectors like tapeworm. Uh, so they'll eat the tapeworm uh, and then live in the flea gut uh, and it'll, it'll be present in their saliva and their poop. And, um, you know, it, that's the other thing. In addition to eating, they're, they're, they're pooping as, as larvae and adult. Um, and that's part of the, the disease transmission, particularly in tapeworm. Um, so if it, you know, poops on your dog food or, in, or if your dog is grooming itself, uh, the dog can eat the tapeworm. The the tapeworm can enter when the flea bites the dog. Um, the then your your dog can actually be a, a vector for the tapeworm eggs, and it can come off of your dog. And then if you touch your dog, and then you know you, you touch your mouth, and and now you've eaten the tapeworm. Uh, so a bunch of ways. You know, I know Chad the Nature Dad is one of the ones that told me never touch your eyes, because uh, that's a, one of the ways that you can get uh, diseases into your, um, you know, body besides your mouth that we're all kind of, yeah, don't touch your mouth, but yeah. Also remember not to touch your eyes, um, or, or pick your nose. Actually, I, there was a, one of the things I learned on the, um, how stuff works m website is that picking your nose can actually lead to dementia, uh, because of, of certain diseases that can enter your mouth your, your nose. So, you know, I wish I would have known that 40 years ago, but, uh, even in the absence of diseases, you and your dog, can can just react to the saliva alone. That can cause triggers. Uh, there's a protein in the flea saliva 
that with in the absence of any diseases can still still make it hard on you. So, uh, you know, as you'd expect, any animal is going to have varying degrees of allergic reactions. From dogs, it can be barely they you barely notice that your dogs have it. Too, they can start getting these really these hot spots, these these bald spots, and then it's made worse because the dog is itching or, or biting it, and then that can be it can be really a big problem. Um, and then in humans too, you, you can have an outbreak of, of, uh, it, it's a little rarer in humans to be allergic to fleas. Um, but, uh, so most of us won't even know on our bodies that, that we have a flea infestation, but, uh, some of the population you will know, you start, you'll, you'll start to really react. And if you do react and you get bumps, like with mosquito bites, this is another one of the biggest dangers because you scratch them. And when you scratch them, you get little micro tears in your skin and that allows an entryway for some of the bacteria uh, it, to get into you. Um, and when, again, it, it's, it's totally gross, but when the flea is biting you, it, it's still pooping. And so you scratch the, 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 you know, what itches and then you introduce flea poop into you. And um, that's historically what's been the most dangerous part of, uh, of flea bites. So particularly in the cat flea and the oriental rat flea, uh, both of them carry a bacteria called rickettsia, which is the vector for a flea-borne typhus. Um, and uh, you, you, in addition to all the other ways I mentioned, you can breathe it in, um, or again, you can just introduce it into you in, in, in so many different ways. Typhus can be fatal, but fortunately it's easily treated. Um, and you, you usually recognize that it's happening before it reaches a fatal stage. If it, So uh, that's a good thing. The other darker and, and way more deadly flea-borne disease is, is the, the bubonic plague. Um, and, uh, you know, if the name itself isn't ominous enough, uh, essentially the bacteria that causes this plague is ingested by the flea. And um, then it develops a film in the midgut of the flea. And then that causes when um, the flea is getting its blood meal, it regurgitates that bacteria. And then it's only... It, very easy that again for that bacteria to make its way into you it's very easily transmitted uh there have been major outbreaks that have you know changed the course of history um from the plague of justinian in the year 540 of the common era and then the black death in 1350 both of these events killed a sizable fraction of the world's people um and you know it, it may seem like the bubonic plague is a thing of the past, which it mostly is, but the flea that spreads the bubonic plague is still found in New York rats, according to a recent study. Um, thankfully, the bacteria is not found in these fleas at the moment, but the pieces are in place should the bacteria make its way back there, and the bacteria is around. There are, in fact, a few cases of the plague a year in the U.S. every year annually, you know, maybe less than a dozen, mostly in the South. Um, so it isn't eradicated completely. Uh, which is a little surprising to me. And you, you do still get small outbreaks uh, worldwide. Uh, and it's so it's something that the World Health Organizations are monitoring very closely as we don't want the Black Death to come back. Um, oftentimes, fleas have very specific hosts. Sometimes they're very general. They'll feed on just anything that's warm with blood. Um, but sometimes they feed on a host group. So there is a genus of fleas that feeds exclusively on armadillos, the armadillo feeding fleas. There's a genus of fleas that feeds exclusively on bats. And there is even a genus that feeds exclusively on elephant shrews, uh, which I really wish we had in our backyards because um, just look at them. They're, they're really cute. Um, so that's kind of fleas in general, uh, you know, Closing with an observation that for such a tiny, tiny, tiny animal, it's it's had a, a fairly inordinate impact um, on human history and even our culture. In addition to, you know, the historical events, the plagues, um, uh, it's 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 penchant for pandemics. Um, and but because of that, it's also been very well studied. Uh, and because of that, it's also worn its way, you know, quite a bit into our culture. It, it's one of the things you learn uh, as, and from a young age, just like you learn what a frog is, you learn what a flea is at a pretty young age, you know, even though it's, it's, a, it's just one insect, uh, it's, it's woven its way into our culture. Uh, and so again, very, very well studied and well studied for a long time because of the impacts on humans. Um, the ukulele, 
is the then is translates as jumping flea with the idea that your fingers are jumping all over the strings and then if you play the strings of the ukulele without pressing down any of the strings it plays um the well-known series my dog has fleas um it's the name of a pretty good vocalist and bass player uh and by pretty good i mean arguably one of the best bassists of all times uh flea with the red hot chili peppers uh, often ranked second just behind the bassist for The Who, John Entwistle. Um, and this has become a bit of a thing of the past, relegated to old movies and Bugs Barney, Bunny cartoons. Um, but there is this thing called the Flea Circus. It does have a bit of mythical mystery to it. Um, and when you see a Flea Circus, or, you know, they're still around, uh, but mainly probably better when you saw a Flea Circus, uh, the first question you'd probably ask is, is it real or is it fake? These little things are moving around. Uh, questions that you also ask for professional wrestling and roller derby. And uh, a lot of us can tell you firsthand that modern day roller derby is a for real sport with incredible athletes. Um, <clears throat> and with just like with roller derby, uh, there is there is some flea circuses that were fake. Uh, and so when you, you know, go back to like the made for TV roller derby, I, I think a lot of that was, was more like professional wrestling and it was more of a show. Um, and there were, uh, flea circuses that would just like, you know, slight slights of hand. Um, you'd have little magnets that would move contraptions like merry-go-rounds. And so like, you know, you'd pretend like you could actually see the flea circuses that jumped from a high uh, platform into a, a bowl of water that would splash and it was all just little contraptions to make it seem like there were flea circuses so that a, a lot of them were fake but surprisingly there is a huge there was a huge art form practice um, a hobby of flea circuses that actually used trained fleas and by training the fleas I really mean they just kept the fleas in a in a jar with a low ceiling so they just couldn't jump. And then at some point, the fleas just give up on the idea of jumping because for a, a, a real flea circus, you actually don't want the fleas to jump. Um, so just like with real circuses, there's a lot of questionable ethics in the flea circus. The, the process of training a flea to not jump takes about three months. Um, and you really can't start training a flea until they're about six months old. It it sounds even to me like I'm making this up, but I promise you I'm not. Um the the other part of the training is making the flea collar. So to see a flea and a flea collar, you need a look, you know, electron micrograph helps. Uh, very different from the, the flea collars that you'd buy for your dog. This is an actual collar or a harness that you put around the flea. And again, this is an eighth of an inch long. So you're talking about extreme miniaturization. Um, and and so it's it's not a surprise that a lot of the flea circus trainers came from the ranks of watchmakers who also worked in extreme detail and in the miniature. Um, and these extremely miniature harnesses weren't just made of like of tiny fibers. Uh, a lot of the early flea trainers would actually design and engineer and make tiny pieces of steel and iron and brass. Oftentimes they had an actual lock with a working key and the entire harness with the lock and the key would weigh one, would, six one hundredths of one gram, which at the time there was a unit of measure called a grain. Uh, and I, I tried to find a household object to compare that to, and I really couldn't. So just understand that, you know, these watchmakers are making extremely small, extremely light harnesses. I mean, essentially it'd be like as if they were making out of aluminum foil, but they're not, it's, it's actual steel. Um, and then once the harness is on, it's on for the rest of the flea's life, which at this point is going to be about three months max. So the, the flea circus operator is hoping for a good three months of performance time for its trained fleas. Um, there's no retiring the old fleas to to a farm. They just they would just work until they're done. Um, but uh, the reason that they don't want the fleas to jump is they want the fleas to move and pull things. Essentially, that's really what they're they're doing. They want them to pull things and ex they use those legs that can jump so high. They're also extremely strong. A flea can lift up to 60 times its body weight, um, which again, that alone isn't that much, but that would be essentially like a human 
uh, picking up a boulder. And even if you could pick up a boulder, that boulder would just crush you. So um, for their size, fleas are incredible jumpers and incredibly st strong. So they've got like the jump of a frog hopper and the strength of an ant uh, rolled into one. Uh, the strength would then often be used with harnesses. This is a real picture to pull miniature chariots or or coaches or whatever horses would pull in those days. Um, and or, you know, because it was a circus, they'd they'd pull tiny merry-go-rounds, uh, essentially like a mill. And remember, these photos are really blown up because the, for the flea to get that big, uh, you know, that's an eighth of an inch long. And so these circus features are also very, very tiny, uh, much tinier than they appear here. And that's where the watchmaking precision comes into play. Um, so the, the, the kind of OG flea circus person was a watchmaker named Mark Scalliot way back in 1578. So I don't obviously don't have a picture of Mark Scalliot from the year 1578. Um, and he didn't have a flea circus, but he was the first to really show that you could train a flea to perform. Um, and so that, you know, for about a hundred years, this, this kind of spread, uh, a lot of folks thought flea circus trainers were using sorcery, which actually to me is a easier explanation than the actual precision of what they do, um, or, 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 you know, what, what they did and what they do, uh, because, um, it's just, yeah, it's incredible. The, it, it really caught on in Germany in particular. And so flea circuses are often associated with Oktoberfest celebrations. Uh, and so you can see on the sign uh, from an Oktoberfest that uh, not only were the fleas performing, they were also dressed up uh, in human dress. So part of the humiliation that went along with that subjugation is that in addition to training fleas, they dress them up. Um, and those are obviously flea mounts. Uh, that tradition made its way to the U.S. And some of the biggest flea circuses here back in the day were places like Long Beach in California, Coney Island. Um, there were some other strongholds in other parts of the world, uh, particularly Blackpool, England. Um, no, sorry, not Blackpool. Uh, Black, um, Blackpool's a warbler. Black something, England. Uh, and like I said, not entirely a thing of the past. Um, so... Uh, oops, sorry. Wait one second. Let me just. Um. So yeah, flea circuses. It's like, you know, there there are there are some modern day, uh, folks that are still into it. There's a historian you can find on YouTube, who recreates some of the old flea circuses. They still train fleas to to the day. Um, it it is kind of a fun rainy afternoon rabbit hole to explore if if you're you know if you've got some time. Um, it's part of our history. Uh, I'm not all that excited about the concept of training any living creature to serve and perform. Uh, and this seems like a particularly harsh life, um, but uh, it is what it is. There are a lot of other animals named for fleas. Um, in fact, we almost did a flea in the past. We did uh, this kind of flea, which isn't a flea. This is a, a snow flea. Um, and if we had any snow right now, I'd tell you to go look for the snow fleas because because March, early March is a great time to find them, but we've had a pretty atypical winter, at least from the past, um, probably becoming more typical. But snow fleas are not fleas. They are a type of springtail. There is a really beautiful group of beetles called the flea beetles. Um, and then there's another crazy group of animals uh, called the sand fleas, which aren't fleas. They're actually a type of amphipod. They're more like, you know, they're like more like a crab. Or, or a shrimp than a flea. But they're also parasites. They're also pretty nasty and gross. Um, these, these, these little bastards actually burrow under your skin, so they're not ectoparasites. And then once they're under your skin, um, they actually call their friends in. Uh, it's like once one's there, the others are attracted to, and they have a little, a little wild party under your skin, which can be pretty brutal. Um, also spreading diseases, uh, also can be really, really rough. And you do get outbreaks of these in certain parts of the world. They can also wait out uh, in there. But um, if you isolated one, it couldn't have an outbreak because they actually reproduce under your skin. Um, and and so just one won't do it. You need, you need a, a few. Um, 
So what do you do if you're lucky, unlucky enough, excuse me, to get a flea infestation at your house? Um, you know, you'd know it in several ways, either because you start to find them on your dog or your cat or their bedding or your bedding. Um, sometimes you find the actual fleas. Sometimes you find dried blood or, or poop. Um, there are a bunch of treatments to choose from. You could call an exterminator. Uh, I'm personally not a huge fan of pumping my house full of nasty chemicals. Um, so I would at least, if I were to call an exterminator, look for the different options available. So there's topical treatments. Uh, there are chitin synthesis inhibitors, which means that the next generation of fleas will hatch without that chitin armor. Uh, and so it makes, you're essentially raising a generation of soft fleas, which are much easier to kill, uh, much easier for your dog to kill or your cat to kill. Um, and they just don't have the protective armor. So chances of, of survival are much lower. There are also growth regulators that keep the next generation from hatching. But whatever you do, you got to make sure you're getting all the generations, um, even the ones that are waiting it out as eggs or cocoons. Uh, and you need to, you know, if it's inside your house, you need to treat all your bedding, all your dog's bedding, wash everything in bleach and hot water. Often you need to keep your house super clean. Like they say, vacuum like twice a day, take the vacuum canister outside to empty. Um, if you're in a warmer climate, the source of the fleas might be your backyard. And you can, you know, one of the ways to, to, to help find a, an outside source is to walk around basically barefoot. Um, cause if you come across the source, then you're going to start, you, you'll, you'll notice the fleas are jumping on your feet. Um, you, there are a lot of kind of hippie alternate remedies, um, that, that, you know, folks will say, get rid of, gets rid of fleas, um, brewer's yeast, garlic, vitamin supplements, ultrasonic collars. Uh, but apparently none of these really work. Um, so you have to be super aggressive, super thorough, and you really want to completely wipe them out. Uh, it's difficult. It's why we don't like them for the most part, um, like bed bugs. But that's the flea. Incredibly well adapted. Uh, an awful, unwelcome visitor to our house, uh, but an important part of the ecosystem. Um, and and even with all that, in my opinion, not worthy of the awful life of a circus. Uh, one of the critters that, like many others featured here, is fun to know about from a distance. And... Uh, that's all I got about fleas. So thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next week.